Deus. Este screenplay, este... There is a delay always. Oh, is it still not working? Yeah, so we were. I know that voice. So as I say, you can you can try to represent different numbers uh, just using binary codes or whatever code. Okay, no questions. This this is very basic. Probably this is like we're getting bored about this. So let's come back to the very basic types that we discuss uh, of variables in 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 C or in any other language in computer science. Um, one thing to notice is integers can be represented exactly. Uh, because because the same reason that we saw before, basically I can choose whatever integer and I can keep just adding more base to the representation, more powers of the whatever unit I choose to, to use as a base. <coughs> the only problem with that is, which is the size uh, that I want to use in memory for allocating the representation of the number, okay? And that's why it's, we have different uh, types of integers. Um, for most languages, uh, uh, the typical size of an integer is 32 bits, where, <coughs> sorry, one bit is, say, for the sign, so if it is a plus or minus, and then the other 31 bits are just for representation of whatever quantity I want. By using that convention, you can, you can see that the range of numbers that you can represent go from 2,147 millions to 2,147 blah, blah, blah millions. If you, if you decide to use unsigned uh, integers, meaning that you use the sign bit byte for, for extra representation, then you can go up to 2 to the 32. Okay? Minus one because you are choosing the zero there. So, okay? We are going to see that there is a danger associated with this representation, and it's, there is nothing wrong initially with, with the representation itself, but it's due to the limited amount of space that we decide to allocate for each representation. Uh, there are more, more variations of integers. There are long integers, uh, which they usually have 64 bits. Um, they are way longer than, than the usual one, the, the, the typical integers. Uh, is twice the size, so that's the range of numbers that you can allocate, basically from minus two to the 63 to two to the 63, and always minus one because the zero is always there as well. And if you decide to use unsigned long integers, you can go from zero to two to the 64 minus one, and the reason of minus one again is because zero <laughs> is also represented. Okay. Let's check uh, more in particular in C++. Uh, turns out that the car type, just one character, is also considered kind of an integer. It, uh, the size is one byte. And then we have different flavors like short, int, long, and long, long, which is a very long one. Um, I think it's a feature of C99 and C++11. Uh, this use eight bytes. The others are four bytes or two bytes to show. And these are different versions of how, how to define those. We, we already have seen that. You can use uh, short int or just short or int, uh, or you can use long int for long ones or just long, um, or long, long int or long, long. I think the preferred ones are because it doesn't lead to confusions. Um, and then if you want to avoid or you want to use the, the whole range for having more representation if you know that you're going to be working with uh, either positive or negative numbers. This, this unsigned thing can also work if you are using negative numbers. You just put a minus in front of everything, and that's it. Uh, you can define unsigned. So you have a larger range of numbers that you can represent. Okay, And the range is roughly there. So if you are using one byte uh, sign, it goes from minus 28 to 27, if you are using one byte and sign from 0 to, to 50, 55, and so on. Okay, you can see the, the numbers, but uh, they get really, really large. Yep. 
Uh, do you know what must mean to have an unsigned child character? Think of a character as that has those rules. The one by signed and one by unsigned. You usually don't use parse as a character if you do sign. I think basically you can think about the ASCII representation, right? Like the ASCII call yeah, of, so, the, of the... So the one byte unsigned are a typical car, and each number is assigned there. That's, that's how it works. But when you use them as integers, you might want to find. I never try. I should try to see what I got to get with. <laughs> no, you can always... You always have 256 characters. The, the number of characters is the same. It's the range that moves. So if you are using unsigned, it goes from minus two, uh, 128 to 127. If you are using uh, sign, no, sorry. If you're using sign, it goes from minus 28 to 127. If you're using unsigned from 0 to 255, but the number, the range, because it's the same size. It's just an abuse of a type. Yeah. So when you use it as an integer, you don't, you don't think about character. Use it as a character, don't think about it. If you need a one, yeah. a one byte integer for one reason or another, it's there, but it's also. Okay. So let's see something. So one of the things I mentioned is um, because this range, you can imagine that some things can happen, right? Um, associated with the size that you decide to have, uh, for each variable, uh, what happens if I add in two integers, but my range goes only up to 32,767, uh, and then I decide to add just one, I go beyond that limit, and what will happen? Well, that, that, um, that kind of problem is no like overflow. It means that you go beyond the range that you can represent in each variable. So I have a, a tiny piece of code there. Um, I'm going to use uh, just the standard functions. I'm going to define an unsigned short uh, integer x, which is equal to 65,535. Um, it's the largest 16 bit unsigned value possible. I'm printing the value, the screen, and then I'm just adding one. Okay, so it will go to 65,536, which is out of range. Okay, and we will see what happens. So, file the code, run the code, uh, and now. Uh, Uh, output is weird. Should say x is uh, so the values are. Flip, sorry about that. So you should, you should say x was uh, six five three five six thousand sixty five thousand five three five, and then you should say it's zero. I don't know why the output is wrong. Oh, okay. I know why the output is wrong because I ran the other example. Actually, it's another case of uh, overflow, but now. I start with zero and I'm subtracting one, and because it's unsigned, it will go all the way around and we'll start with the maximum. Okay, sorry about that. Is that clear? So, in the, in the previous case, you should have said the other way x was 65,535, and now x is zero. Um, and when I say, and when I run the, the case uh, in the bottom, it should say x was zero and now is 65,535. It's, it's basically a circular representation. So there are other, other ways to represent numbers. The usual one or the most uh, natural for us will be what is called fixed point numbers. And basically, it says that you have a, a decimal point and, and you have a, a, that decimal point in a fixed, in a fixed position. Um, it's, it's very natural for us because it's the way how we operate, how our brain operates. Uh, the issue is that it's not very well suited for uh, scientific computing because the, the numbers can go in a very wide range. However, it's used in other fields like financial time series uh, because they only need a finite number of decimal places. But if you are running an experiment or a simulation where you need to improve your accuracy, then uh, we are going to see there is a, a better way to represent that allow you to have more control in the precision and in the accuracy of the numbers that you that you get. Just want to, to mention this, and that this is not the case uh, where you're going to find this kind of representation, at least in, in the traditional codes. Okay. 
the, the way that we usually or we used to represent numbers is what, what is called the floating point numbers. It's very similar to the, to the scientific notation, if you want. Um, basically, it's composed of three or four parts. The sign, there is always a byte, a bit for the sign. The mantisa, which uh, it gives you basically the value of the number in whatever base I want to represent. Then the base and the, and the exponent. So there are four pieces, sign, exponent, mantisa, and the base we are going to assume is 10. So basically, a typical single precision real number has 32 bits or four bytes. One bit is for the sign, eight bits for the exponent, and 23 bits for the mantis. Okay, and, this, and the expression is always like that. The base remains fixed, it's, it's, it's a base 10, and then the exponent is what changes and gives you how many decimal points you will, you will have or how many um, units in whatever base in, in base 10 you have. Okay, a double precision number has 64 bits or 8 bytes. Right? Uh, so let's, let's review the types in, of floats in, in C. We have the, the typical float, which is 4 bytes, like the one that we just saw, a double precision float, which is 8 bytes, and a long double, or a double double, which is, depending on the architecture or the compiler, it can be 12 or 16 bytes. Okay? And those are the ranges. You can see that the ranges go from 10 to the minus 38 to 10 to the 38. Um, and you can see that for the 16 bytes, the long double goes to 10 to the 4,932. So it's, it's a wide range of numbers. <laughs> It has also different precisions uh, depending on, on the type. Uh, it can have seven, uh, seven significant dishes, 15, usually 16, uh, 20, 30 something. Um, it depends on the, on the type as well. Again, examples how to define the float, just float, double, long double, and then it can be initialized on the fly as we saw before. Okay. This is just a review. There are also special numbers or special symbols, if you want. Um, every time that we deal with numbers or with uh, mathematical and arithmetic operations, things can go wrong or not wrong, but uh, find limiting cases. So there are the infinites, plus and minus infinity. Uh, it can be the result of an overflow or a division by zero. Uh, they can have signs as well, showing the tendency, how, how it went to infinity if by the positive branch or the negative branch. There is the not a number indicator. It can, those can happen, again, divisions by zero or zero over zero, infinite over infinite, something basically that the computer doesn't know how to compute. The infinite is more an indication that things blow up, that the representation is too large. But a not a number, it can be something that basically I don't know how to compute, the square root of a negative number, for instance. These are, um, Indicators that usually something went wrong in the computation, of course, and we, we should be aware of those. Okay. Any questions? This is pretty straightforward. I don't know if you have any, any questions, but if you have, please ask. Okay. Um, as, as many other things in, in C, there are some standards, and there is what is called the C numeric limits interface which is a set of templates. And basically, those templates are the numerical limits of whatever type I can choose, because it's a template, right? So I can choose uh, to have the numeric limits of a long float, or the numeric limits of a long, long float, or the numeric limits of, of an integer. And the interesting thing is that they have some member functions already defined for you. And some of the very nice ones, or more useful, one, useful ones are, the minimums, the lowest, the maximum, epsilon. We are going to see that in more detail later. Uh, infinity and others. So basically, I can ask for each class the numeric limit of the type of the interested and then the function. So it will determine which is the minimal uh, or the smallest finite value that I can represent in that type or which is the maximum and so on. Okay, so let's see some examples of that. So, this case, and, and so you need to include 
uh, the limits um, library. And then basically what I'm, I'm plotting there, I'm printing there is just the numeric limits of integers, the lowest and the maximum value I can represent, the same for floats and the same for tab. Okay. The slash t is just uh, a tab. So basically we'll tabulate things. So I do, the, the idea of this is you don't need to remember uh, this kind of table. Okay, which is the range or which is the maximum and long, uh, lowest value. Basically, can ask uh, the compiler and your operating system to tell you what is that. Okay, so I compile that using the C11 standards, run the code, and then I have for the integer the lowest and the highest value, for the float the lowest and the highest value, and for the double. So, so, so. These values change the same. Yeah, I may. Not only that, it depends also sometimes on the compiler as well. If you're using Intel compilers or new compilers. So what is transfer? Mm -hmm. In some cases, it depends on the operation, depends what you're doing, but in some cases, it And we're going to see more details why it will. Okay, so it's a good point to take into consideration. That's why we, so at the, at the end of the class, I, I hope I had the chance to emphasize and, and make it very clear why we, we stress so much to test everything, to test especially, again, your known solutions, your analytical solutions, to, to be sure that your code behaves as you expect to be. Okay. So something that, that is kind of related to your question is, okay, things can change from computer to computer, from architecture to architecture, from compiler to compiler. But uh, there is a way to try to keep some standards, and the IEEE uh, has two standards, 754 and 854, uh, which is uh, how to represent floating point numbers in uh, four bytes and eight bytes. So the seven is for four bytes, 754 is for four, five, four bytes, 854 is for eight bytes. The, the, the representation is, as, as we saw before, initially is one bit for the sign, uh, some bits for the exponent, and another ones for the mantissa. Okay, so it's always the same way. That's, that's how actually we represent the number. So the computer represents the number. So then you have to do this operation of putting the pieces where it goes uh, in the exponent and multiply the mantissa by 10 to the exponent and then add the sign. Again, these are the ranges. Um, it's not like too verbose what I can say, just reading the numbers, but the point is keep in mind that there are always ranges and there are always uh, granularity involved when you represent these numbers. The other interesting thing, and this has to, I, I, I should make a, a strong disclaimer here. Uh, first of all, check that you have this file. It's, it's not universally installed by any compiler, but it's more something from the system. But you can check if you have this file. If you have this file, the IEEE 754.h or 854.h, uh, you can use some features from this header file. Uh, it's a IEEE library, basically, that provides some functions uh, that will allow you to compare up to certain precision uh, to two numbers. Okay. Um, as I say, I, I, I like to add this this uh, piece of code here just for for the sake of the argument that there are some standards and that you could use them for, for comparing numbers up to certain even precision, but probably we are not going to go into details. If you have questions, feel free to, to ask later. Okay. So let's start the questions. Let's start to discuss what kind of things could go wrong. You already saw some of the examples like the integer uh, overflow. Uh, but things can go also wrong with with uh, with floating points, okay? Um, and this, as I say, it has to deal with the with the feature or the nature of how we represent the numbers. Uh, there is a finite length for the floating point variables, and we can exceed that. But there is also the feature that there is granularity. There is certain delta in the in the numbers that we can represent. Um, so I have a piece of code here. Uh, just an example, I had a float number 0 0.01, and then I have another uh, float, a double float, uh, 10 to the minus 17. 
I create a function output. But basically what it does, it prints those two numbers, the addition of these two numbers, the subtraction of these two numbers, the multiplication, the division, the inversion of the division. I don't have the output, but I invite you to, to try it at home. You will be surprised what you will see. In some cases, you will see that uh, it's not what you will expect. Uh, in particular, I have some, I, I don't remember if we mentioned this, some, some people was asking about this at, at, at the very beginning when we have the first assignment. Some of you were surprised that when you create this interval of points, the zero wasn't exactly there, and there was something like 10 to the minus 15 or so. I don't know if you, some of you experiment that, but some of you, I remember, you did because you were asking questions about that. And the, and the answer is, well, it's, it's the way in how we represent numbers uh, and, and this granularity itself. <laughs> and not only that, you, you can actually play with some um, with some member functions from the from the uh, what is called the I/O manipulation library, so you can set the precision and you can set how to represent uh, the number. So I set, so I have as I, as I as I say again, try this example at home. So I have this output routine before setting a fixed floating for, uh, floating point format or sorry for setting a fixed floating format uh, and after, and you will see that. Some results may change also, uh, depending on the representation that you do with your numbers. Okay. You stress that the results don't change the way yeah. they're printed out. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, the other thing I, I, I want to add is, um, because of this granularity, this, this discretization in the way that you rep we represent continuous quantities, there is always something called uh, unit in last place, which is basically an error in the discretization that you do. So if you're, if you're having just a number like 1 over 3, which can be think as 0 0.3 or 0 0.33 or 0 0.3333, basically it's a number, it's a rational number, it doesn't have a, a, a close expression. Those kind of numbers can, they will always have a ULP, basically a unit in last place error. Same thing, another example is 0 0.1, you should try to represent that number in binary. Another thing that can go wrong, and this is one of my favorite ones, because it's so naive and so simple that you can never imagine that this will go wrong. But what happens when you try to compare two numbers? Okay? You are doing computations, you have floating points, and you are comparing two numbers. In this case, I have f equals 0 0.1, both floats, and then g is the square of 0 0.1, OK? I'm printing those to be sure what I get, and then I'm asking, OK, if f f, which is the square of, uh, well, sorry, which f s, which is also assigned to g, is equal to g, then print true, if not false, OK? Then I have another part, but let's run that part first. I compile and run, and the output is false. Then what I define is a tolerance, 10 to the minus 15. And I ask, OK, is the absolute value of the quantity I just defined less than a given tolerance? And if it is true, then print true, and if it's false, then false. So basically, what is happening here is because of the representation and the arithmetic that I did with the representation. I told you 0 0.1 doesn't have a binary closed form, right? By doing 0 0.1 times 0 0.1, what happened is, sorry, what happened is the machine is going to have these unclosed representation forms. When that's the operation, that won't no way match uh, the 0 0.01 that it should be matched. Okay? So the first, the first um, thing to take home from, from today is never, ever uh, decide to compare a number like this. Use always an absolute value of the difference of those and given a tolerance, OK? So in that way, you have control of errors due to runoff or errors due to representation. And you have also control of the tolerance that you are setting in your program. And it's very, very simple thing. But we probably never thought about that until it happens, OK? Questions? Comments, doubts? Have you seen this happening to you before? There is, uh, there is no general 
rule of thumb, but there are some rules. The most conservative rule is to set this close to what we call the machine epsilon, that is something we're going to discuss, which is of the order of 10 to the minus 16, depending on the representation that you are using, depending on the type, and depending on the architecture and compiler, but it's of that order. And I will show you how to know, how to extract that information from the system. Uh, it may also depend on your problem. If you are fine with a tolerance of 10 to the minus 5, that's, that's good as well. It, it, it depends. So the, 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 the answer is, if you want to be really conservative, you can uh, stick to a machine epsilon. If, you, if not, or because your problem is hard to converge, you may want to consider something like 10 to the minus 5, which is about in a million or something. Okay. Other type of errors, runtime errors. And this one is also very interesting. It's, it's kind of fun. So you have three numbers, A plus B plus C. And surprisingly, changing the order in how you add those numbers won't match. Okay, so if I add A and B first and then C, it's not the same as adding B and C first and then adding A. Why is that? Okay, let's take an example. Uh, usually this kind of problem happens when you when you have a big gap in the in the in the range of the numbers. So in that case, I have two of the order unity, and then I have one of the order 10 to the minus 16. So I, there is a 10 to the 15 orders of magnitude difference in that representation, 10 to the minus 16, 10 to the 16. And on, on top of that, C is pretty close to the minimum representation that I can have for this type of variables. So just I'm printing this, uh, this manipulation. In this case, in cap, instead of, of adding, I'm subtracting. So it will be more obvious. So I'm subtracting A minus B. So 1 minus 1 is a 0, and then adding. 10 to the minus 16, so that should be 10 to the minus 16. In the second case, I'm adding 1 to the 1 plus 10 to the minus 16, and then subtracting that from 1. So in the first case, I get 10 to the minus 16. In the second case, I get 0. And the reason is because when I add 1 plus 10 to the minus 16, there is no way I can keep that 1 in the 10 to the minus 16 position to be represented in the same value. It just fall off from the, from the range of, of numbers I can keep. So that is something, again, if you are dealing with number of, number of, of order in unity, you can think of C as noise, and that will be fine. But if you are interested in perturbations, in, in tiny effects on, on the stable system, maybe you are losing the, the thing that you are interested in. Well, a minus b in the first case is zero because the representation is, is fixed. So in the first line, it's exactly zero. So this, this first thing is zero for sure. And then I keep just that, right, in canceling one and one. In this case, I get one, which is 10 to the zero, plus 10 to the minus 16. So in my representation, there is no place to add this 10 to the minus 16. So the computer just throw it away. And then when I subtract this minus this, I just get the zero. Any other questions? So related to this problem is this concept I mentioned before about machine precision or machine epsilon, which is basically an upper bound of the relative error due to the rounding or, or, or the truncation. Um, for single precision, it's of the order 10 to the minus 8. For double precision, it's of order 10 to the minus 16. Um, it may happen in different situations. So the one that we just saw was a subtraction, but it may happen also when you are dividing uh, two numbers that are of the same order, roughly, um, and you are forcing the computer to do operations near this limit. So there will be naturally losses there. Um, it's tough to catch these things. So one of the things is, if you know a priori the order of the numbers, you can start to play this kind of, of tricks, right? You can all invert, so first subtract, then add, or whatever. But if you don't know a priori uh, the, the range of your numbers, these things just can, can be controlled sometimes. So this is an example. This is kind of an explanation of what happened. So it's, it's, let's say that we have um, a mantissa precision of 3 and exponent precision of 2. 
So this is a, a toy model of, of the, of the runtime problem or the machine epsilon. In this case, the machine epsilon is 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 2. So what happened here is I added these two numbers, right? This is like the 1 plus the 10 to the minus 16, but I'm choosing 10 to the minus 3 now. So if I, if I explicitly write this number, it's 1.00 plus 0 0.001. So if I had a mantissa of 3, I have three digits I can keep for my mantissa. There's no way I can represent this guy having this unit here. That's, that's basically the point. Is that clear? Uh, so this machine epsilon is a very important number for anyone doing computation. So let's see how we can compute this machine epsilon and, wh and what it means. So there are different ways to define it. One way uh, you can think is, okay, it's the smallest quantity, smallest quantity x such that 1 plus x is different from 1. So I can think of something really, really tiny and it reaches the value of the machine epsilon when uh, this quantity tiny makes the unity that I'm adding to different from one. Or sometimes you can define as the largest. It, it, it basically, it's a cutoff. Um, so I have an example here. Um, it's basically representing kind of, of the previous example, but in different way. Uh, so I have a quantity f or then one, uh, one, and then g of order 10 to the minus 18. So I kind of told you that, that the machine epsilon is 10 to the minus 16, roughly. So let's see what happened here. So I'm computing, so I compile, I run, and then I'm computing 1 minus 1 plus 10 to the minus 17. That's kind of what happened before. Now I, I want to add 1 plus 1 plus 10 to the minus 18 minus 1, and I get a 0. And it's basically the same problem as I got before. I cannot represent that quantity. And if I add even 1 plus 10 to the minus 18, I get a 1. This is because I below the machine epsilon. So that quantity cannot be represented in this kind of value. Okay. So how we, how we can uh, know which is the machine epsilon or have an idea? I kind of told you, should have not told you. But one way to, to do this is to get a number and start to divide them by two until the moment that, and I add that number to the previous number until the moment that that number doesn't change. Okay? So that is the code I implemented here. It's called halving epsilon, or halving epsilon. And, and the, the nice thing I want to, to show you from this code is something, I don't think we mentioned this in the course before, but this code is using a function that is recursive. Basically what it's doing is the function is calling the function itself until it reaches a condition. By the way, recursivity is awesome, but it's very dangerous. So you need to be careful, especially when you mix that with pointers because things can go to hell. Um, so my function called halv takes a double, and it adds 1 plus the double divided by 2, and if I ask if it is greater than 1. If that is the case, it means that I don't have still the, the float that doesn't change the unity. So I call the function again. If I got the number such that 1 plus that number divided by 2 doesn't change 1, then I got the number and I return the number. The, right, <laughs> the danger is that sometimes if you don't specify very clearly the condition to leave the recursivity, it can be there forever. And sometimes when you mix that with pointer and you lost track of your pointers or your pointers are at handle, you don't know if you are, you are staying in the function forever because of the recursivity condition or because you lost the pointers in the But they are very efficient. Well, they are very elegant. Efficient is, it depends on the problem. Efficiency depends on the problem. But they are very elegant. So basically, I'm, I'm starting with epsilon equal 1. I define in a variable called half eps. Uh, and then I, I'm calling the function. You see, I, I could do a for loop or a while loop. And the only thing I'm doing just is calling one function one time. So it's, it's from, the, from the programmer point of view, it's just one line instead of a for loop that has a condition embedded there. Okay. Some people say that it's a more natural way of pro programming because it's the way that we think. In any case, so I, 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 I run this program, compile it, run, and then 
I, I run it and then get in that halving the value, the smallest value is 1.11, lower than 10 to the minus 16. And then I have another one. Remember the numeric limits that we, we saw before, the templates? I have a, a member function called epsilon. That's basically tell you which is the machine epsilon. And then he says that is 2.22045 10 to the minus 16. So roughly I get the right order. I get the order of 10 to the minus 16 and I get roughly the half of the number. And that is because I'm basically halving. I could have given return f instead of f over 2. You want. But, the, but the, the order is of the order. The number is of the order. In the same way, just to show you, um, you can use these uh, numeric limits templates with different types. So the integer has an epsilon, of course. We will see. Anyone can guess which is the epsilon machine for integers? That's it's easy. Remember, when someone asks you about a va numerical value, the answer is 1 or 0. What do you think is the answer here? Right? Um, and then for, for floats and then for doubles. Okay? So I'm just using those templates. I compile, run, and, and the epsilon of, of the integers is 0. We, saw, we mentioned that at the beginning, right? Integers are, are um, represented, represented exactly uh, in the machine. The only problem with the integer is that you can go beyond the representation, right? Uh, so those numbers kind of make sense to what we mentioned before. For floats, it's 10 to the minus 7. For, for doubles, it's 10 to the minus 16. Okay? So with those, with those libraries are very nice and useful. Implementing your own machine epsilon code for determining the value, the value is, is also fun, but, but you can just use the, the standard um, templates from the numeric limits. Sure. But keep an eye on that. Check that those values, especially for comparing with your, with your computations. Okay? Something that you need to be aware of. OK, so this is another example. It's a more uh, intricate example, but it's still useful. Because you will see, we, we start with um, so what this the example is doing is computing. It's, it's defining a range from 0 to 2. Um, the range is defined here. So m is 200. I had a constant k here of 100. So I'm defining a range of 200 values that goes from 0 to 2. Okay? And then what I'm doing is computing the square root 200 times of the values in that range. Okay? So basically, I have real numbers from 0 to 2. I have 200 of them. And then what I do is I compute the square root of each of these values. 200 times. Okay. And then I want to recover those values. So I, I square them 200 times again. Okay. And then I save them into a, a, a file. So far, it's an ASCII text file. We shouldn't do that, but we don't know yet how to do it in binary. We're going to see that. But I'm basically saving those files in, in a, those that values in a file. Okay. And deleting my my array that I allocated at the beginning, return zero, so on. Okay, and so this is the result. The green line with the crosses should be the numbers that I get because basically I'm plotting each number against each number. Okay, what I actually got is this line, zero and one. You know why? Any ideas? The reason why I got this is because after taking 200 times the square root, I start to lose precision of my numbers. And if my numbers were below 1, basically, I went below the epsilon machine, machine epsilon, and it was pushed to 0. And it was above 1, it was pushed to 1. OK? So bottom line is, even when you start with a very well-defined variable, like a range between 0 and 2 with 10 to the minus 2 of precision there, separation, by taking certain amount of number of certain number of operations, like 200 times the square root, it may sound abusive, but it's a legal operation I can do. I may lose precision. Okay? 
So you need to be aware of, about that too. The order of, of magnitude of the operation is, is, uh, is in which way is affecting the representation, the number that you represent. Okay, I invite you to try this code. I don't think it has a bug or anything. It's just that loss representation after certain number of operations. Okay. So this is another example of, of the representation when we have subtractions. We kind of saw one of these examples. So if you have 1.23 minus 1.22, then you get 1.21 times 10 to the minus 2. So initially, notice that we started with three significant figures. We end with one. So this, again, may sound very uh, not dangerous or, or provocative, but if you see this embedded in more computations, you're basically losing precision in the representation that you are using. Okay. And by the way, this uh, by performing this kind of operations, when you lose precision uh, in the representation, it's called catastrophic, catastrophic cancellation. Okay. Um, So we, we, we discussed an example of overflow with integers. Notice that the overflow can happen in any kind of variable, in particular with, uh, with floats. With the integer, it's kind of funny because it's circular. So it starts back at the coast by the other side or, or it starts back. With the floats, it's a bit more intriguing. Um, so in this case, I have one float, 10 to the 15. I want to compute uh, fx squared, the, the float squared, or the float cube, and see what it gets. Okay, I compile the code, run it. First, f is 10 to the 15. f squared is 10 to the 30. f cube is infinity. Okay, this is an example of an overflow with with floats. Again, it can happen with any kind of types or, or numeric type, I should say. Um, there is also what is called the underflow, that is, it's kind of having, so the, the overflow is I'm going beyond the range I can represent. The underflow is when you have numbers that are too tiny for the representation, that they cannot be captured by the gra uh, granularity of the representation. So in this case, uh, you can see I have flows, the order 10 to the 35, 44, 40, and then very tiny ones, minus 44 and minus 46. Okay, so, and this is just without doing any kind of operation, just assigning values. I compile the code, I run, and what I guess is, okay, I get the minus 10 to the 35, the minus 10 to the 44, I kind of don't get it, I get a minus infinity. The 10 to the 40, I get an infinity. Uh, I get 10 to the 44, to the minus 44 as 9.8, and to the minus 45, and then 10 to the minus 46 as zero. Okay. So again, something that, that should be aware. In a kind of a related matter, and this is more due to the method. So this is kind of so the previous were kind of numerical errors due to represent due to, due to the representation. These are errors due to the methods that we use. But this also somehow associated with the representation. So usually when we do a simulation or, a, or we try to model something in the computer, we, we have, unless that you are working with a discrete math or, or quantum mechanics at the very basic level, you will be always or almost always using continuous variables. So the problem is how you go from the continuous representation to the discrete representation. And there is a whole field about how to do that. If you, if you study mechanics, there are constraints that you want to preserve. There are formulations that try to tell you, OK, you are doing a Hamiltonian, how you should discretize your Hamiltonian in order to preserve the constraints, and so forth. In this particular case, let's say that we have just space and time, and we are discretizing for the sake of evolving an equation. So basically, there's no way that we can do this in the computer uh, other than just having discrete variables for each of these quantities. Okay? So but at the moment that you do that, just by the nature of the representation or the mathematics underlying that, you will see that there is an error associated with the discretization, just by going to the continuous to the discrete. So having an idea and a measure of how that change is, is very important. So it's a sort of error that one has to be 
aware of. It, we, we are going to see more in detail that it, it depends on how we are discretizing the equations, and there are different ways to have control on the accuracy and the precision in how we discretize that. Um, it's always a good idea to check that it, it depends on the resolution, meaning if I had a grid and I, and I have spaces in my quantities and I reduce that space, the error should go down with the resolution. Otherwise, there is something fishy there. The other question that we may always have with this kind of representation is which resolution is good enough? Okay? And for that, for that is something that we're probably are going to see in, in following classes is convergence studies. So basically, you want your most accurate SAT solution, you, will sh will you, sh you should use infinite resolution, which is not available in computers so far. So instead of that, what people do is uh, they do resolution studies or convergence studies. So I start with a resolution, I get my solution. I start with half that resolution, I get a better solution. I start with half of the half of, that of the initial resolution, I get an even better res solution. By doing that, you can see what is the order of conversions and what is the solution to which is converging the, the problem. And that's something that if you are publishing papers in, in, in a numeric field, your references are always going to us. Um, so convergence study for, for, for understanding the effect of the resolution in, in, the, in your code is very useful. In relation to this discretization issue, um, there are some rules that have to be respected. And one of my favorite ones is the CFL, or also known as Coram Friedrich Lirich factor, which basically is a recipe that tells you how you should choose the discretization, especially when you are evolving things in space and time. And, and I like this one very much because it's basically something that you can think in terms of physics. Basically, what that condition is telling you is that you cannot choose your space in space and time in such a way that the velocity at which the information is prop propagating in the grid is faster than the typical velocity of the system. Okay, so there is always a coefficient C max such that delta t over delta x should be less than. Oh, awesome. Okay, so this one we're going to discuss further later. Uh, just let me mention this is something we, we kind of is embedded in what we discussed today, the truncation error. Think about the exponential function. The exponential function has a Taylor expression that can be given as the sum of x to the n over n on factorial. It's not possible to compute the number explicitly by adding all the terms in the, in the sum, right? So at some point, you need to, to trunk that summation. And when you trunk that, you have a truncation error. That truncation error basically is giving, is giving uh, you the, the error in the expression that you're using. And you can see that the power of the x there is basically the order of there. Uh, we will discuss this next time. And this is just a summary of the things to remember from today. Integers are stored exactly. Floater points are not. And because of that, you need to have in, in mind some things that may happen, like test inequalities with the absolute values, for instance, uh, the catastrophic cancellation, the machine epsilon, and be aware of overflow and underflows. Well done.